Excellent. Okay, so uh, firstly, uh, thanks for Paddy and um, uh, Penny for inviting me to, to present today, or accepting my paper to present today. Um, really, I'll be discussing my thesis from my, my background from uh, the last kind of six years, but within that, I'm hoping to generate that discussion that we've been talking about already through the last couple of papers. Um, so, briefly, today, I want to just go over the early Middle Paleolithic for those who aren't necessarily familiar with the direct record uh, within the room, and giving that context within a wider context, but also specifically about the site of Lecoq de saint which I concentrated on a lot for my thesis. Within that, moving into a wider landscape perspective of the Channel Plain region and the Monch uh, in general, and giving some significance behind that, and then obviously discussing the models that I've uh, produced on this, and really discussing how they can be used and be improved on in the future. So just as a quick landscape perspective there, Lacotte's sat in the middle where the star is, and just to show that it's within a landscape of Neanderthal activity, this is a landscape that I've defined myself, so don't consider it as this is Neanderthal preference zone, it's just a way of constraining my analysis within the general thesis. And for a perspective on that kind of early middle Paleolithic, it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, this is just a simple MAS curve. Um, uh, the broadly, that arrow there shows what has been kind of defined as that early middle Paleolithic. And specifically, I'm going to be discussing occupations of the cop during MS7. So we can place that right away into that uh, early middle Paleolithic period rather than being having to discuss whether it crosses over into other general periods. Briefly, then, that MS7 integration is quite it's significant, or significant specifically because it's highly variable in comparison to the previous two, MS9 and 11, for example. It's got these two warm peaks here, and interestingly, this is one of those assumptions that we've just been discussing, because this is actually basing our proxy on sea levels, which I'll discuss more in a minute, also climatic levels within that region. You've also got a very sharp cooling period within the middle of that occupation time period, and then actually occupation well into the MS6 glacial period, extreme cold period uh, globally. As I that context, that background then, uh, the changes that um, occur within that MAS7 integration itself is those two warm periods uh, within a, uh, and then a cold period. Overall, it's a cooler than the previous two, so we're not seeing the evidence of the higher sea level, but you're also seeing a cooler landscape and a more open landscape than we've seen in previous and obviously our current interglacial as well. And you've got those two distinct periods of climate within that. Overall, it's still a warm uh, uh, interglacial, so we still see the Neanderthal presence, which I've already shown with those, just showing those sites quickly, and also we have the megafaunal presence, specifically in the region that we're talking about in northwestern Europe. Le Cap de saint then has been uh, discussed uh, a lot over the last kind of, it's been excavated for nearly 120 years now. The last uh, excavations finished back in the 80s, and since then it's uh, been almost shelved, if you like, and reproduced uh, based on those initial ones. And part of the last 10 years has been the Ice Age Island team actually re-evaluating that landscape, uh, that uh, site and landscape, and my association is coming strong through that. Overall, that's a very large lithic collection, and that's obviously, with me coming from a British background, it is an extremely large lithic collection, but even within a general Euro North European um, area, it's large. It's have approximately 250,000 artifacts from the, just from uh, the excavated area. Spanning that MAS7, so that's the period that I'll be discussing, and I'll give you some more chronological background in a second, but specifically it does go into MAS3 as well, so we have got later occupation periods within there. It's mostly a continuous reuse uh, of the site, but of, over very short periods, it never seems to be a densely occupied site, for example. Uh, probably associated with some kind of retooling, we see that behaviour throughout Neanderthal occupation of this region in general but could actually be somewhere between a provisioning and reprovisioning of the, of the general area using local raw materials, but also, well, almost certainly processing of animal remains as well. And that's what particularly you see with the two famous bone layers, the bone heaps of layer A, uh, layer a and layer six. It's those bone heaps then that gave us kind of the, that idea, that shelved idea that's had there for the last 30 years about how we understand the cop. And it was originally suggested there was a degree of herding of mammoth over the top of this. And it's this, uh, process, it's this uh, initial idea that kind of uh, spurred the re-evaluation of the project in the last 10 years. Just as a quick background then, we've got this association of these uh, large megafaunal uh, animal remains, mammoth and rhino, and you see a separation within the site and some kind of caching, uh, um, stacking of these different 
materials across the area. And then obviously you have this association directly with Neanderthal activity with the large cutting tools, often in this sense, uh, the bifaces that are associated. And the initial work, so done by uh, Martin and Richard Bates on this idea of GIS in the landscape, has now shown that actually it's more likely that these mammoth uh, remains are getting the site from further afield uh, and potentially some kind of association, if I can get there, with uh, this major now submerged landscape and corralling within these river valley systems and uh, uh, they're actually eroded doline systems as well. So that's how it was re-evaluated and now we, we can look at Lakota in a big different way. But specifically, those bone heaps fit into those two uh, circles there. So it's the top of that sequence there. Um, chronologically, that's looking at the very, so I said that how this occupation of the site within MA6, those layers are within that kind of cool, general cooling period into the glacial. My research then actually looked at the lower layers, layers H to A, uh, somewhere in the region of about 220,000 to about 160,000. And again, another assumption based on that chronology that we have to understand when we're discussing these things in, in general anyway, and I'll summarise in a minute. But overall then, that's looking at a change in behaviour and a consistency of behaviour over approximately 60,000 years at the end of the early middle Paleolithic. Back to our regional output then, so looking at that back into a regional uh, perspective, Lukot sits right in the middle there, obviously, because that's how I framed it, but it's within a Neanderthal activity area associated with these other sites, and that's not an exhausted list by any means, especially towards the east of that region where you get a lot more that we just see for coal, for example. The material culture then is quite a typical Mousterian type toolkit. You get in scrapers, notches, denticulates. One thing to highlight quickly, I'm not going to go too much into the lithics because it's not the space of this paper, but broadly is what they're actually doing at Lukot is a lot of multi-tools and they're refining their tools right the way down until they're becoming completely exhausted. And that's because of a distance from the raw material, from the really good raw material flint sources. And you can see they are using a very different types of uh, flint source based on, you get some chalky, thick chalky cortex, uh, indicative of direct access to raw material probably to the north of uh, what is now Normandy, and you get some very worn down, and this is a clip that both has a uh, collection from beach resources, so old gravels, and also river sources, typical of what you see uh, across eastern France in general. And it's that kind of raw material uh, element that led me to using GIS to try and map this landscape and trying to discuss a little bit more about Neanderthal movement. Within that, they're also using a lot of different raw materials other than flint, as a support system, if you like, to add to, the, uh, to their ability to, to exist within this landscape. And that includes some finer grain materials that's potentially coming from the American Massive, a quartzite type material, but also really heavy, chunky materials like the quartzes, which are extremely local to the site itself within five kilometres. Overall, then, so within that, we can kind of give a bubble of, uh, Neanderth uh, of understanding Neanderthal tool technology, if you like, in a quick and easy way. So very used to these raw materials because they're coming from various different areas. They're being travelled through that mobile landscape. There's an economic use of flint because that's the really good uh, material that that's what they want, if you like. Uh, and so they're really finding it down. Uh, they're using this a specific type of resharpening technique, which is defined by um, Cornford uh, in 1986, uh, based on long sharpening flakes, LSFs. And then what effectively that does is take off the whole edge of it of a previous tool, normally a scraper, and then re-evaluate it. Sometimes they're retouched into more scrapers, sometimes they're actually just used as fresh uh, flakes. And within that then, that can then is what, uh, like I said, what drove me to then expand that into the wider landscape and trying to understand where those resources are coming from and how we can map some kind of mobility uh, within this general day-to-day -day life. So it led me to downloading, eventually this was actually a Gebco data set, I tried to create my own data set based on uh, stitching together different uh, map uh, systems, but it's actually it's much more applicable, and that's one, uh, another kind of one of these discussions that is, is actually access to data. And a lot of the material, if you want the really high resolution data, you have to pay quite a lot for it. And especially within uh, the system around Jersey and Northern France, where actually a lot of telecommunication work is going on at the moment, and that data remains in the hands of those companies uh, up to a decade. Going back to some of the assumptions that I, I showed before, so based on these proxies uh, that we have for climate, which is also given our proxy for uh, sea levels. So that's a, a, another general idea. And then there's also, so this is actually represents 
uh, a data set, this is a GEBGO data again, but with a, a glacial isostatic adjustment applied to it. And this isn't applicable to the time period I'm discussing, but it's just worthy of noting that you can see basing that uh, glacial uh, modelling onto the system shows a completely different model of what the landscape would have looked like. So this is more applicable somewhere in the last glacial maximum, around about 20,000 years ago. Overall, then, I came to the kind of uh, end point of producing these uh, very simplistic models for, the, for, for what the questions I'm asking. But you can see automatically from how I'm presenting them, I have to present them with some kind of uh, brackets, if you like. So I've got where the uh, land actually uh, defines itself is that uh, sea level at that time, but then the red represents potential low points and the blue representing potential high points. So even within the presentation itself, we have to kind of have these brackets and assumptions highlighted. And then if we put the geology on top of that, or, uh, well, in this case, underneath it and transparent, you can see that actually all this red material actually represents the really good quality flint resources. And you can see, therefore, based on those assumptions made in the, in the past one, that the constant changing access to those resources based on sea level at any one time. And overall, it does show what I was hoping it would show is the logistical use of, of resources within the Lacotte and further afield and how they're travelling through the landscape and therefore a structured use of space, again connected back to those bone heaps in the very upper layers of that material. And you can see broadly based on a very simplistic overview of, my whole, of the whole thesis is that when sea level is at its lowest and therefore flint resources are further afield, they're actually using a lot more of those local Developed uh, quartz sites and quartzes uh, directly immediate to the site rather than uh, reusing, rather than travelling to find the flint, or at least that's what they're discarding within the site itself. So, to sum up then and um, show those problems and caveats and hopefully start this discussion that we're uh, looking for today, it's that access to data, both uh, accessing it through from different companies but also being able to pay for it if, if you're in a position of uh, PhD funding. Inherent assumptions and guesses that we have to make, and this is an uh, 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 extensive list, I'm sure we'll come up with more today, but things like one that I didn't mention is uplift, so general uh, glacial uplift uh, associated with general uh, uplift within the landscapes. You've got sea level, you've got something I didn't mention I never applied to my models, which is tidal uh, changes. The current tidal uh, range, for example, in Jersey is nearly 11 metres, it's a large uh, tidal range. And you've also got that submerged geology, which is 30 to 40 metres below sea level. And again, if we have a better understanding of where those are, it might automatically generate different models within the system. And then obviously we've got the typical paleolithic problem of chronology and trying to define that in any more uh, meaningful way. And then finally, we're ultimately trying to understand Neanderthal behaviour from our modern perspective. So that's another assumption based on the whole uh, paleolithic archaeology, if you like. So that's just briefly um, kind of a summary of what I, I've been doing for the last six years. So is there any questions? Mm -hmm.